today we are extremely lucky to benefit from the insight and the input of a um, fantastic expert on online freedom of expression, Michi. Welcome, it's Thank Miki you. Chowdhury, who is a technology lawyer who works in uh, New York and India. She has over a decade experience in the area of intellectual property right, open source licensing, privacy, surveillance, platform liability, and many, and many other things. She has litigated very important cases, and we will hear more about that. Uh, but she is, uh, most importantly, somebody who is uh, one of the leaders in, in India and indeed around the world on the protection of freedom of expression in the digital world. So, uh, Michi, I am so happy you could join us for, for this interview. Thank you for having and, me here. Uh, maybe to, uh, to begin with, for, for our uh, wonderful students, could you um, tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the situation in India? Let's, let's begin with India and the um, digital uh, challenges in, in India that you have, uh, you have seen uh, and the challenges to online freedom of expression in, in the context of your country, which is well known for becoming one of the leader uh, in terms of that technology, but how does that impact on the realization of freedom of expression online? So, um, India has around 320 million internet users, uh, most of them who access internet via mobile, and that country is leapfrogging into this new era where it doesn't need the bra, it doesn't have the old infrastructure. And the rapid proliferation of mobile and internet connection actually brought a lot of people online. Um, it is a country which is very well known about software skills and development and being um, the, prayer, the place where everybody outsources everything mm -hmm. in the world. But that also means that uh, a lot of people were already aware, but still compared to the large population of the country, which is over 1.25 billion people, this is a small percentage. But it's becoming rapidly a bigger market, a very big market, and perhaps um, one of the two largest markets in the world after the People's Republic of China. So <clears throat> that also means that a lot of social media platforms are now being used and have changed the way people communicate. And as much as it has done well for the free speech and expression, it has also shifted um, the norms which we earlier took for granted. An interesting thing which happened, and not only starting from a very earlier time, but even now, a lot of people on Twitter or Facebook or such other platforms which are now open tend to believe that India and Indians, uh, the Constitution of India guarantees them a right to free speech and expression, which is akin to the First Amendment in the United States. Hmm. Would have been very interesting, but uh, the First Amendment to the Constitution of India actually introduces reasonable restrictions over the free speech and expression, which means that some speech can be actually restricted in favor of um, uh, sovereignty of the country or national security or um, defamation and there are seven categories out there. So uh, to me it was very fascinating as a lawyer that everybody who was on Twitter and Facebook were always fighting, oh we have First Amendment rights and why are you telling us to keep quiet or say something differently? Mm. And, uh, and that also tells you about the power of connection and internet that people think that those national boundaries are being knocked over and somehow the law also is is now traveling in the same way as packets travel or information travels from one part to the other. So that's a very fascinating thing and I hear a lot of other people also tell us similar, similar stories. About the issues here, um, India has a robust judicial system which mm -hmm. has um, which has had great things to say about free speech and expression. Um, however, not as comprehensive as uh, perhaps we would like. I am not a big fan of reasonable restrictions for that matter. Um, uh, when internet, 
when the communication change because of internet and social media platforms and other ways of communicating, people really thought that they had somehow discovered their voice. Mm -hmm. um, as they say, there are no really voiceless people, but only ones who are either not allowed to speak or are deliberately not paid attention to. This was their way of trying and say, here is what I think, and here is where I do not need to rely on anyone else but these platform companies, mm -hmm. and I'm going to just tell you what my opinions are. And um, that really changed the conversation quite a lot. In, um, in the last few years, I have seen primetime television actually relying on Twitter to decide what the story tonight will be and having a ticker about what's going on <clears throat> on Twitter and how, r how rapidly everybody has adopted Facebook pages, Instagram, or having a hashtag for everything, like popular culture is now surrounded around this. But we cannot also ignore that most of the internet access is still in English. Um, because of the colonialism and imperialism of uh, the 19th and the 20th century. M many Indians speak English, but still all of us have, um, we have more than 18 scheduled languages, so there are their own languages, and availability of content is not there in their own languages. The, it's changing, and increasingly more and more people are able to communicate in their own languages, but English remains the primary mode of communication online even now. So that means also there is a capturing of the English speaking audience of the discourse which goes around here. Um, this is all very interesting, but there was only one information technology act, one law which, dis, which was going to take care of everything online, mm -hmm. enacted in the year 2000, um, which of course has proven to be time and again inadequate and also shows how much uh, India seems to think or behave like a nanny state uh, in various forms, whether it's about films or it's about um, books or, uh, but, but Twitter or social media seems like a new animal, a beast which they do not know how to contain. Mm -hmm. And tendency of most governments or most authorities is, you, is uh, in the beginning was to control yeah. and the desire to control <clears throat> is universal. Um, so, in the prior government, um, what we saw was there was a section particularly in this act which was told to us, we've copied it from the UK, so that somehow makes it fine. I do not <laughs> know how it does actually, but um, uh, we didn't copy it verbatim, but we have, uh, we got inspired from there and it's for the protection of women and it's protection and it's also for filtering of spam. Uh, notoriously known as 66A, um, has its own hashtags and infamy, uh, which it brought upon itself. Uh, very vaguely termed, uh, very vague terms used and making a punishable offense, um, even something like a status update on Facebook or tweets. In the beginning was not very well used. Mm -hmm. But soon uh, the authorities found their great tool and the police for political censorship was more than eager to use it. Um, and uh, thereafter followed a lot of other stuff which happened both in the courts as well as in civil society and uh, the use of uh, social media by this new government and in the election which happened in 2014. So, all in all, I would say, like the rest of the world, it has changed um, the way people communicate with each other, um, but also to the authorities. And no matter how much of um, the election machinery or the traditional government wants to use it as just a mouthpiece, they, cannot, they can no longer just keep the conversation to themselves. Mm -hmm. Nobody is able to keep the conversation to themselves. It's whether it's narcissism or it is voyeurism or it is just the desire to be able to speak. And for the first time, so many people have found their voices. Their voice. So there is real democratization even in India.